Hello, and welcome to Living Truth, a media ministry of The People's Church. Wherever you're tuning in from, we're thrilled that you have decided to join us for our time of worship as we grow in God's Word together. Today, our friend Danielle Strickland shares with us how the unstoppable resurrection power of God is not just something that happened one time in history and not something we only encounter once a year on Easter. Let's dive into what God has to say to our hearts through Danielle today. Well, hello, peoples. It's always a joy to be with you. Not, not making that up, it's true. I like it. Uh, I was thinking all the time we were worshiping there, I was just had this um, thought. It, it, it was a leftover thought from last week. How many people have a lot of leftover Easter thoughts? I feel like there's so much. I mean, the core of our belief is, uh, is wrapped up in that death and resurrection of Jesus. And so pretty much the entire year is about the death and resurrection of Jesus. Let me um, read to you a passage of scripture. Maybe you want to read along with me. That would be great. It's uh, Gospel of John chapter 21. This is one of um, Jesus's post-resurrection accounts. So there are several of these. This one is significant, I think, for a couple of reasons which we'll discuss, but it might be familiar to some of you. This is uh, Peter and the disciples and Jesus's appearance to them post-resurrection and it's starting at verse one. John 21, starting at verse one. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they are not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. So the event has happened and now keeps happening. Jesus is at work bringing resurrection life to those people who need to know it's for them. It's real, and they're invited. Now, commentators will tell you in the story uh, about the context. There's a couple different ideas. One is that Peter is basically just hungry and has to go catch fish. So maybe Peter goes fishing, even though he's supposed to be waiting for Jesus somewhere else because it's, uh, you know, he was hungry. <laughs> Fair enough. Other commentators suggest that Peter going fishing is signaling uh, a giving up. Peter sort of feeling like maybe he's disqualified himself. So if you don't know the whole story, you'll know that just a couple of chapters earlier, Peter has denied, publicly denied Jesus three times. Peter, even though he went into that situation of the crucifixion of Jesus going, I will never deny you, turns out he did deny him three times, just as Jesus had predicted. And most people will suggest that Peter denied him kind of in front of him. Like there was at least a, he could see Jesus and Jesus could see him. So there's some woundedness. There's the, uh, some betrayal there. There's some denial there. There's Peter kind of coming and slipping into this disqualification of himself because of his own incapacity to be loyal to Jesus. I tend to think that Peter probably is slipping into that it's too late and it's too hard category. A context that we should be pretty familiar with. 
Because I believe that our culture and our worldview right now, the, the, the water that we swim in, the air that we breathe, is a fatalistic worldview. A fatalistic worldview. If, if, you, if, you're, if you know about the Marvel Universe, you'll know that one of the most formidable opponents of the, the heroes that are trying to save the world is Thanos. You know Thanos? He snaps his finger. His favorite word, does anyone know his favorite word? It's inevitable, I'm inevitable, I'm inevitable. He just keeps saying that over again, I'm inevitable, right? This idea like there's nothing you can do. I snap my finger and the world dies. I can destroy things. He's literally, Thanos, uh, they took the word from the Greek in the New Testament where it says that Jesus defeated death. It's Thanatos. It's a Greek word for death, it's Thanatos. So Thanos is representing death. So if you thought you were watching Marvel and it had nothing to do with the scripture, you're wrong. Marvel owes a lot of money to the biblical texts in copyright. You know what I mean? Like, come on, show some love, Marvel, to the Gospels. This is where you got the storyline, right? Thanos is coming. I'm inevitable. There's nothing you can do. I am in charge. And the idea of the fatalistic mindset is that it's too hard and it's too late. You might as well give up. And I think, you know, there's a lot of formidable enemies out there on the surface. There's a lot of things. Extreme poverty is a thing. The greatest migration in history is a thing. Human trafficking is happening on unprecedented levels. There's a hunger crisis in the world. These things are real. These things are happening. They're threats. But I think underneath all of the threats is just one threat. And it's a fatalistic worldview. The fatalistic mindset that would say there's nothing I can do. This is not only true of massive social issues externally that we're fighting on an external level, this is also true internally too. This would be called a scarcity poverty mindset. I'm too fill in the blank. I can't. I'm disqualified. I'm not enough. There's nothing I can do. This disempowering worldview is where everybody actually begins. What's interesting about this scripture as well, by the way, is in Luke 4, you can look this up later if you want, there's the same story, except it's at the beginning of the disciples' journey. So here they are at kind of the end of their journey, the post-resurrection, this is a post-death, and they're fishing and catching nothing all night. They're discovering the end of their own limitations. They're stuck in this like, ah, there's nothing we can do. We're stuck. And it's reminiscent of the first time they encountered Jesus in Luke chapter 4 when they were stuck again. They were catching nothing. They were fishermen. They had to pay their taxes. They couldn't do it. They're stuck in an empire that pushes them down. They're stuck in oppression. They're stuck not being enough. They're stuck in a place where they can't change anything about their circumstances or their life. And that's when they first encounter Jesus. And Jesus says to them, shocker, I know, try the other side. And Peter's like, I've tried. I'm a fisherman. I've already done. I've already tried. And then in, a, in, a, in an unstoppable glimmer of faith, just give it a go anyway, Peter does it. And boom, the answer is there. An answer of abundance, an answer of unstoppable love, an answer of unstoppable life, an answer of resurrection power in his everyday life. And they, that's when they started to follow Jesus. So here they are all the way at the end of the life. And there it is again. Here Jesus is again. And I want to say that resurrection life has this trajectory to it. So this is, the, this is the trajectory, I believe, of resurrection power that starts to work in our lives. We all start at fatalistic worldview. We're all stuck. Whether we're stuck on the inside or whether we're stuck on the outside, all of us know what it's like to be stuck right here. And if you listen to the news, this is probably what you'll hear most of all. But something begins to move. Jesus moves. Jesus moves out of a fatalistic worldview into a sympathetic worldview. First of all, that's the first movement out, where your heart is engaged, where you actually begin to start to feel something. You feel the goodness of God. You start to feel like something is moving. You start to feel. Now, the reason why this is important is because we've lived through an age, I think that has really got us stuck here, is that we've lived through an age where our intellect has been leading us. Now, it's not wrong. You don't want to check your brain at the door. I'm not saying that. But a lot of us have been raised in a culture or in a worldview or even in a religious framework where we've been denying our feelings, where we've been deadening our feelings. Or we've been living in a world that has been numbing what it is that we've been feeling because to feel is to be overwhelmed. Dr. Paul Brandt and Philip Yancey wrote a book called The Gift of Pay. 
The reason why is because Dr. Brandt was the leading expert on leprosy in, in the world. And leprosy is a disease, he said, is speaking to us important messages about how pain or feeling is a gift that we should be embracing. He said in his research of leprosy patients, what he realized is how leprosy works is it deadens the pain receptors in people's bodies. So when you see the terrible results of leprosy where people are losing their limbs or losing eyes or losing their, you know, the toes or their fingers or whatever, he said, we used to think that was leprosy, but what we now know is that's not leprosy. That's actually the people not taking care of their bodies properly or not even knowing how to do that because they can't feel anything. And if you can't feel pain, then you don't know what's happening to your body. And that's the results of the body are injury. Now think about that in the way that we've learned how to numb pain in our culture. How to numb it, how to close ourselves off, how to stop feeling. And one of the greatest, I think, one of the most beautiful characteristics of Jesus as a person, Jesus as a witness of what God is like in the world, is that he feels he feels. He does not just numb himself. He's not just like, you know what? I probably should go do that thing that God needs me to do or else like it's not out of obligation. It's not out of some rational just a uh, decision that he makes. He's not pressing a button from a room over there. He's right here feeling. As he enters into Jerusalem, do you remember he weeps over the city? He feels, it's called his passion for a reason. He is passionately involved in sympathy, that idea of letting yourself be moved, even by pain, just to feel is a symptom of life. You know how you tell someone's dead? Stick them with a needle. See if they move. Feeling is a way of life beginning to work its way out. But but here's where the great thing happens. I think if we get, to get, we get stuck at sympathy, if all I'm doing is feeling and there's nowhere else to go with all this feeling, then ah, I'd rather be stuck. I, I, you know, Peter might be able to resonate with some of this. If all I can do is open my heart to feel my own betrayal or to feel my own lack or to feel Jesus' pain or to feel, it's like, ah, make it go away. Cue Netflix series, anyone. Make it go away, and we slip back into this, like, shut it down because it's too much. I don't want to feel. But here's the good news about the trajectory of life, is life does not lead you to sympathy. It leads you through it. That sympathy is an invitation to begin the trajectory of the fullness of life. We see this in the witness of Jesus in the scripture, where Jesus shows up to meet his friends because he loves them. You see it, because he's not. He feels for them. He knows what Peter's going through. He knows he's stuck. He knows he's fallen back to where he began. And Jesus is not content to go on with the mission without them because he loves them, because he feels for them, because that's what friends do. But it's not just enough for Jesus to grieve. What does he do? He shows up. He shows up. Jesus moves through sympathetic worldview into an empathetic worldview. And empathy is, I'm with you. <laughs> I'm with you. We're going to do this together. Empathy doesn't just have pity on. Empathy isn't just over from here saying, like, I feel really bad about your situation. Empathy enters in. And we're together now in this. We're together in what this means. I remember my friend Patricia had this vision of Jesus that transformed her in a dream. And uh, she had this dream where she was up to, she was in this pit, stuck in human sewage, literally chained to this pit. And she said she saw a religious community she had come out of praying for her at the top of the pit. And she saw her parents sort of crying for her at the top of the pit. And then she said, then she saw Jesus come with this like white Sunday school Jesus gown, you know? And she said, oh, great. Now there's like a party at the top of the pit, you know, witnessing my condition. And there was great sympathy there, but the sympathy wasn't enough. And she said she witnessed with horror in her dream Jesus turn around and lower himself into the pit. And she thought, oh, great. Now we're both stuck in a pit. <laughs> and she said Jesus turned around and looked at her fully soiled. She said, I watched his white gown just get soiled with this like waste, human waste. And then she said he turned around and I'm like, oh, brother. She said, I looked at him and he was smiling. <laughs> And she said, what are you smiling about? And Jesus said, yeah, we're both in a pit, but I know the way out. But I know the way out. 
and he opened a trap door in the dream, you know, and out washed the water, and they crawled Shawshank Redemption style through to the finish, and she was set free, and it began this trajectory of life for her. It got her out of a fatalistic trap and into follow Jesus into the way of life. One of the other great temptations is that we can get to acting, which of course is the fullness of love, is when we act on each other's behalf and when we act in partnership and mutuality with one another towards freedom, towards life. This is that great, you know, Jesus doesn't just say it's all fixed. Jesus says, hey, I did something that you couldn't do, but you can do stuff too, and we could do it together. You bring the fish, you fish on the other side, you come and answer some questions, you take this gospel message to other people. They're, we're doing this together because life is mutuality, life is partnership, life is resurrection, working all the time in us and through us into the world. It's this beautiful combination of things. Jesus doing what can't be done and us doing what we can do. And together, there being such breakthrough, both inside of us and through us into the world. That idea of moving out of fatalism into feeling and allowing those feelings and Jesus' love to move in us all the way through sympathy into empathy, where we meet with each other right where we need to meet. What's most significant about this scriptural story is that there's only two times where charcoal fire, literally the words that are used in John's gospel to tell this story, Jesus made a charcoal fire at the beach. There's only one other time there's a charcoal fire, and it's where, G where Peter denies Jesus. It's at a charcoal fire. So if you're reading that and you're paying attention to those words that John is using, he's painting a picture of restoration He's painting a picture of Jesus bringing up where that fatalism started to take hold in Peter's life so he can dislodge it, so Peter can feel it again, so Peter can know that he doesn't have to do this by himself, that Jesus is with him in this, so that Peter knows that there's a way out and there's a way for resurrection life to take over where that deadness took root in him. This beautiful resurrection movement of God. I was uh, reminded of this, reading this story, a beautiful story of some NGO workers in India. And uh, in India, in this specific cultural context, um, parents who didn't want a girl, they wanted a boy. So girls are often uh, thought of as less everywhere, by the way. That's not just a problem somewhere else. It's here too, often, tragically. And um, the parents, though, believe that if they name their girls unwanted, literally they name them unwanted, that the, the chances of them having a boy increase the next time. So there are hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of girls named unwanted. And the NGO worker was working with some of these girls in their, in their movement and feeling for them. I feel bad that this is their, like they're named this. This is how they enter the world. This is how they have to move through the world. Can you imagine every time somebody names you, you're reminded that you're unwanted. But they started to partner with these girls and say, what would it look like? And these girls started to say, you know what would be really cool if I could change my name? <laughs> that would be really neat. And so they had this beautiful renaming ceremony together where over 200 girls, um, and it was a very public ceremony, where they actually legally changed their names. And the NGO worker said it was no surprise that about half of them chose Bollywood names. <laughs> and stood up sort of, I'm Beyonce. <laughs> um, and began to actually change. So this is like in 2023. So this was, happened in 2011. So this is, article talks about what the impact on these girls were after they had the renaming ceremony. And it is profound, as you might imagine. What it might mean for these girls to be called by a different name name. When, when Jesus commissions Peter in this story, something very similar is happening. Peter might have accepted a name he gave himself. Peter might have accepted a name that fatalistic worldview would tell him. Too late, too hard, traitor, betrayer, all kinds of different things, coward. But Jesus renames Peter. You remember he actually renames him the rock on which I'll build my church. He renames him and he recommissions him. Because Jesus wants to remind Peter that the power of resurrection life is unstoppable. That not only he can stop it, 
Peter himself cannot even stop the love of God. You yourself cannot even stop the love of God. And that as you experience that love of God transforming you, leading you through a movement from fatalism into sympathy, into empathy, into compassion, which is love personified in real life, which is action with each other towards life, that that same thing that Jesus does on the inside of you, he commissions you then to do with the people that you serve and the people you live with and the people you work with and the people that God has placed you as resurrection life possibility to them. Let's finish with these commissioning words of Jesus in John 21. This is right after that fire and the fish are broken, Jesus takes Peter aside and he says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, maybe remembering his denial, maybe remembering the fatalistic mindset that was stuck on the inside of his thinking. Do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. It is not too late. It is not too hard. Fatalism is not where we live. Jesus' love is unstoppable. And Jesus' love in you is meant to move you towards resurrection life today, right now. And it's meant to move through you towards resurrection life in the world, today, right now. Sing it out. Wandering into the night, wanting a place to hide this weary soul. I tried, and I tried with all my might, but I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting, yes, this vagabond. And just when I ran out of road, I met a man I didn't know, and he told me, But to believe my doubts are burning Like ashes in the wind So, so long to my old friend Yes, burden and bitterness Oh, you can keep it moving No, you ain't welcome here From now till I From now till I walk streets of gold
God, we thank you. Hello, Living Truth family. I cannot express enough my deep gratitude for you, our faithful community. As we reflect on the past few years and all the challenges that it's brought, one thing never changes. God is faithful and his love is secure. A verse that I keep coming back to is found in Colossians chapter one. We read in verse three, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people. The faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. What I love about this passage is that it's written using plural language, emphasizing that we're doing this together as a community and as a church body. Living Truth is a media ministry of the People's Church dedicated to sharing the good news of Jesus with our world through television broadcasts and online content. And we've been doing this together with you for over 40 years. Your faithful and generous support has enabled the ministry to continue to reach into homes and transform lives with the life-saving message of Jesus, no matter what's going on in the world. Our production team continues to work all year long to produce weekly Sunday programming. In a ministry of this scope, there are ever-present production costs. This year, we are facing the challenging reality of cost increases for our airtime and critical equipment and system updates. Would you prayerfully consider supporting Living Truth? Every amount you donate is stewarded faithfully and enables us to continue sharing the love and hope of Jesus around the world. To help support Living Truth, you can make a secure donation by visiting livingtruth.ca or by calling 1-888-269-6085. You can also send a check to the address on your screen. An annual income tax receipt will be issued for gifts of $10 or more. Thank you for the way you continue to express your worship, thanksgiving, and dependence on Jesus through your faithful generosity. As we continue to grow the body of Christ together, may we run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. God bless you. What a great reminder from God's Word today. If you're feeling led to support or learn more about our ministry, visit us online at livingtruth.ca. You can also call the number on your screen to donate. Thanks for joining us today. We're looking forward to worshiping with you again next Sunday.